It has been 40 years since an explosion and fire ripped through the HMCS Kootenay. The Canadian naval ship was in the midst of sea trials off the coast of England when, as one soldier said, all bedlam broke loose. Nine people died and more than 50 were injured in what was the worst peacetime disaster in the Canadian Navy. For years, the men who survived the fire were reluctant to tell their story, but today you will hear their account of what happened in a documentary prepared by the CBC's Sandra Bartlett and Suzanne Reber. Sandra Bartlett joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. Well, why has it taken so long for this story to be told? Many of the sailors didn't see each other after the return to Halifax. The Kootenai had to be rebuilt, and they were reassigned to other ships and other locations. And, of course, given the military mentality at the time of suck it up and move on, Mm. they didn't feel encouraged to share their experiences. So I imagine they just lost touch with each other? Yes, until 1999, when the Navy decided to mark the 30th anniversary of the disaster with a ceremony in Halifax. There, the sailors reconnected with their former shipmates, and as the 40th anniversary approached, they planned what they called a pilgrimage to Plymouth. Now, Plymouth is the British town that the burnt-out Kootenay was towed to. Yes, and where many of the uh, sailors were treated for burns and smoke inhalation. That pilgrimage took place at the beginning of October, so as not to interfere with the anniversary date of October 23rd, which is tomorrow. So 40 years ago, these men would be getting on in years. Yes, they're in their 60s, their 70s, their 80s. And of course, they don't know how many will still be around for the next big anniversary. And so with that in mind, I asked some of them to tell me what happened that day 40 years ago. You'll hear from Russell Saunders, John Montague, Cyril Johnston, and Alan Dinger-Bell. They would have all been young men back in 69, huh? And when you listen, you'll hear stories they've never even told their wives. Hmm. Okay, well, Sandra Bartlett, let's listen to your documentary. This is Explosion at Sea. We were quite excited. We had just finished a European cruise, and we just finished a nice port visit in Plymouth. And we're heading home, even though I was a young bachelor and no commitments in life or... No real time. I remember they used to play records in the uh, bosun's forward section of the boat. You could hear them, you know, the rock and roll music going. So it was just a very upbeat feeling. People were anxious to be home. So it was just a regular morning. And the engineer officer and chief ERA were standing by the main feed tank. We'd started into full power. And, um, Everybody was standing pretty well around the console. I stood watch. I had the, the middle watch that uh, that night from midnight to four in the morning. So I was literally in my bunk. I remember I was sound asleep. And then I opened the door to the laundry, and as soon as I opened the door, there was a, a shutter. The ship shuttered. All of a sudden, there was a whoosh. And then we said to each other, what happened? I said, no idea. I said, maybe we hit a rock out here at sea. You know, I don't know what's going on. First thing we noticed, we both looked at each other, it was a pop. Our ears sort of pop a bit. You look, the pressure changed. And the phone was ringing in my cabin. I grabbed the phone and uh, my, one of my cabin mates was up on watch. He was screaming. And we looked and there was a big wall of flame coming up the starboard gearbox. John, the ship's on fire. Get out, get out. Well, Chief ERA grabbed the telephone to phone the bridge to tell him that there was a fire. Petty Officer McKinnon taking the starboard throttle and trying to turn it back to slow us down. And the engineer officer grabbed the port throttle and try to turn it back. They got it turned and, back. Uh, I was putting on a pair of trousers and I realized I, can't, I haven't got time to do anything else. This smoke just came bellowing as it were. It's thick black diesel smoke. Very toxic smoke. Oh, awful stuff. Usually they say for exercise, for exercise, for exercise. Three times. But this day it was, this is not an exercise. Hands to emergency stations. Fire, 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 fire in the engine room. Hands to emergency stations. This is not an exercise. And then all bedlam broke loose down in the engine room. Everybody wanted to stay alive. I opened the doorway and that very instant I was lifted off my feet and was propelled down the hallway which we call Burma Row. At that instant I looked back and I saw smoke and flames coming out of both hatches of the engine room. That's both the forward and the after hatch. Black, oily smoke. I mean, it was just dense black. The engine room that is full of oil vapors so it's just like uh, the fire went straight up and then swoosh, just swooshed all around the engine room. And there was a, a pump down in the engine room called the force loop pump. And when the casing split on that gearbox, the boiler room didn't know what was going on. So we're up to full power. The boilers are, are cranked up full power. Full power is going to, those, uh, to that force loop pump. It's spraying oil into the gearbox. 
and that oil is splashing out of the gearbox and it's coming all over top of us too and so that just kept going. I looked back and I saw smoke and flames coming out of both hatches of the engine room. I then saw somebody coming out of there who was on fire and that would be our engineering officer and he was going to the bridge to report the fire. I stepped into the cafeteria which had, which had quite a few people in it having their uh, morning breakfast and that was instantly filled with black smoke and flames at the doors. And then um, the petty officer Stringer jumped up from his seat and asked him what it was and I told him what I had observed. And so we got the servery open because there was no escape other than over the servery. It's a big steel wall that drops down. A shutter is a better word. And we got that open. Uh, the cook inside opened it and uh, the guys, there was about 30 sailors, they couldn't get past us to go out into the hallway that was burning so they had to go over the surgery. So I, I can't move. Uh, everything is heavy. I've lost the oxygen in my system and consequently moving my legs or arms was impossible. Eventually I went unconscious. The other person in my cabin, a poor guy, a young Air Force private assigned to the ship just before we sailed from Halifax. He, was, he couldn't move. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go. He didn't, didn't know the layout of the ship. So I literally grabbed him by his belt and I pushed him down the passageway. You couldn't see. But you, I knew the ladder was straight ahead. And boom, you hit that steel ladder, you know. And boom, he, we went up that ladder in one heck of a hurry, I'll tell you. You've got two choices. You can stay where you are or you can leave. And I think instinct kicks in, at least for us, and we just opened the door and ran for it. And we were heading for the ladder, which would be, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 steps away. It was still black smoke, and we went up there's the ladder. There's 10 of us down in the engine room, and there's a la the ladder we had to get out was about 15 to 17 feet high, a very narrow ladder, and everybody's on fire, and everybody wants out. So, so some people were climbing over other people's backs, People were being dragged down the ladder, falling down the ladder, dragging the people up behind them, dragging them down. Everybody would fall, and then they'd all get back up again. It's, it's the will to live, I guess, you know. It's not after you, Garcon. Everybody's on fire. Well, I got dragged down the ladder three times, the third time, and I just said, you're going to die. I can't get to that ladder. You're going to die. Everybody just went calm, just calm. You know, no panic, no pain. The world stopped. Everything just stopped. You know, your body knows you're not getting out. You're not getting out. And then we went to the bridge. Most of the officers did to see what was going on. The bridge on. is like way up high in the ship. And the fire's down in the engine room. But that's how fast that smoke spread. When I got there, there was the commander. And there was uh, the officer of the watch and uh, the second officer of the watch. It was just the three of them. They were trying to steer the ship from an emergency steering quite calm there. I mean, nobody was shouting or hollering, not like you see on TV, you know, it was just quiet and very professional. And um, there was a ship, a merchant ship on the horizon coming towards us probably about, I don't know, eight to ten miles away. On the bridge, they lost communications with everybody, communications with them, so there was no way we could talk to anybody. By instinct, once again, I, I knew we were in trouble, so I grabbed an emergency flare, and I said to the captain, uh, I've got one of the emergency flares let me know when you want me to fire it. And sure enough, shortly after, John, let her go. Flares were fired at that merchant ship, but he didn't stop. He just kept going. We had a beautiful system all organized, but the organization immediately fell apart because of this disaster. And then the next thing, Al Kennedy uh, came up. That was the, um, said the engineering officer, and he came up and uh, he reported to the captain about what was going on, gave his report. His face was black and burnt. Uh, I think I think he had coveralls on. They were all full of smoke and black. And he, he was dazed. He was in shock. He was in awful shape. In fact, I didn't know what it was. His hands and face were black and the skin was just dripping, you know, like literally hanging down. He was in a state of shock. He was just standing there vibrating. You know. Then he passed out. And then I uh, was standing there and I remember what else can I do? Then I realized, oh, I'm shivering, I'm freezing. The North Atlantic in late October is a cold place. So I said, oh, I have extra clothing in the diving locker. And I went in there and I had a pair of summer sandals and I parked it. So I put the park on my sandals on and, I, and as I'm doing this, 
in came Sub-Lieutenant Clark Reifenstein, and he started putting his tanks on. I first thought he was panicking, he's going to jump over the side to save himself. No, the very opposite. He, he, I said, what are you doing? He said, there are people down, trapped down below, and there's no Chemox breathing apparatus. We can't get down there to get at them. So I'm going, I said, well, wait for me. I got my rig on, then Cy Johnson was there. We put on our diving tanks. There was four of us available. There was Reifenstein, Clark Reifenstein. There was John Montague. There was myself, and there was uh, Abel Seaman, Ken Fisher. So we put on our diving gear, and we went to the starboard side hatch, which would be on the you know quarter deck on the starboard side. And uh, we went down the hatch, and it was full of um, black smoke, but you could see flames coming out of the after engine room hatch, and there were two two sailors there that were fighting the fire. I, I was brought up in separate school and our nuns used to tell us what hell was going to be like if we were bad boys. And that was the thing that popped in my mind. This is what hell was like. I went unconscious and um, came in and out of consciousness several times. There was a red light off to my left which was a deck light that comes on during emergencies and I was kind of hanging on to this light. Uh, at the same time the milk dispenser above me was 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 knocked open and so there was milk all over the deck where I was laying. It probably cooled me a bit and then I would go unconscious again and then there was a couple of us in there I said are we dead yet? And one guy said if it did you wouldn't be asking questions and then someone's foot was moving around and it was Burton Tiffin and he was wearing a Chemox rebreathing apparatus and this is a unit that you put on if you're going into a fire and it, it uh, takes the carbon dioxide out of your system and turns it into oxygen and pumps it back in again. So what we're doing is, and he was asking, is anybody in here? Is anybody in here? And I reached up and I grabbed him by the leg and he wasn't moving <laughs> until he took me out of there. Not a very big man, but mighty and strong in strength. And he was about five foot seven and just carried me right up the hatchway. We were looking for people. We just didn't know who was there and who wasn't. There's four of us and we're just moving along in the dark. I came across Reifenstein and he was struggling with the body. The person was quite, was obviously dead, but he was blocking the door to the boiler room. So we struggled with his. Anyway, we got this body dislodged and uh, we were able to open the door and uh, Reifenstein went down and I, I carried on. I couldn't do anything for that body, so I carried on looking for other bodies. I think we had a saw flames, we would have backed off, but we didn't see any, so we just kept moving until we got to the um, after boiler room forward engine room hatch area. There was a sailor laying there, spread eagled, on his face, and uh, uh, well, he had no clothes on him. Anyway, there was a sailor there, he was spread eagle on his face, and um, he was lying there, and was, he had no clothes, except for a white pair of underwear, and uh, he had fouled that with feces, I remember that, just looking at it, and you could see the sort of smoke, and I think some flame coming up, because it was light, so we could see him. Fisher came around, and he grabbed his wrists, and I grabbed his ankles, and it was, you know, just an awful feeling I was revolted by, because his skin was squishy and it was, felt like it was going to come off of my bare hands. But I managed to overcome that feeling, and we carried him forward to the officer flats again, and we carried him there, and um, the doctor was there, and they were looking down from above, from the wardroom flats, the next level up. We left him there for them to come down again. I never did see his face, and quite frankly, in some ways, um, it's good that I don't know who he is. All of a sudden, it was just terrific increase in heat. The heat was unbearable, but all of a sudden, it just it, it doubled. And someone screamed, it's going to blow. I heard it. Get out. Everyone get out. And so I whew, went back up to the upper deck. <laughs> then they wouldn't let us go back down because uh, that's when I heard someone say, geez, those tanks could explode and you make the, you know, you make the, the conditions worse. <laughs> After three times being dragged down the ladder uh, and just the pandemonium that was going on at the bottom of the ladder, what was the point in trying? My, my brain said, you're going to die. I tried to stop one guy from grabbing people and pulling them and throwing them out of the way. And he just took me and he just threw me to the port side of the engine room. And when I stood back up, they just started dropping dead in front of me. They just started dying. Just... And when they died, 
There was nothing more to keep me from getting up that ladder. There was nobody else trying to get up the ladder because they were all dead at the bottom of it. So I started climbing the ladder, but the ladder was so hot that the skin was coming off my hands and I couldn't hang on to the ladder anymore. So I started using my forearms and every time I put my forearm on the ladder, when I lifted big hunks of meat would come off my forearms. I guess I got about three quarters of the way up the ladder and I couldn't go no further because there was, there was somebody on the ladder. He couldn't move, so I had to put my head up his butt and push him up the ladder, and I got him up high enough that I got the door open, and he fell out. Well, when I tried to get out the door, I tripped over him, and I fell in the deck, and it was that hot that the blood coming out of my arms, and that was actually bubbling, just like it was in the kettle. I was cooking like an egg. I made it to sick bay, and uh, the doc was in sick bay, and he had me sitting on a stool. And he was picking pieces of clothing off me that was, you know, what was left of my shirt. And uh, we were sitting there, and I was looking at the kickout panel, and the smoke was coming through the kickout panel into the room. And I said, Doc, I said, we got to go. we got to get out of here. And he said, just a minute. He was trying to grab his stuff, but I wasn't waiting. So we were going in circles. The ship was actually going in circles. All the wiring and all the controls were, were burnt. The salt water was coming over and, and landed on top of me. And that's when the pain started, when the salt water hit all them open burns. So I got 49% burns from the waist up. Eventually, I just I said, I gotta, I gotta go. The waves were coming over the forecastle. Nobody was coming down to get me, so I said, I gotta get up there. And I said, either the waves take me into the ocean or I make it to the bridge. And I made it to the bridge. Well, by that time, they, they, the helicopters and the other ships were coming over dropping off supplies, dropping off people, you know, from firefighters who, who had, who specialized in fighting fires and, and I don't know, lost track of time. 40, 50, 60 minutes later, they had the fire under control. It looked like sort of bees around a, their nest and helicopters were buzzing around there and Robbie Robichaux was directing them and they were coming down just off the quarter deck, you know, just, I don't know, maybe two feet off the quarter deck. They weren't landing, they were just hovering there. They were dropping off personnel and equipment and taking wounded off and, and that sort of thing. Probably was in the afternoon, early afternoon, when the fire was over. People just sort of sat around and, you know, we were probably in shock. Then I went down to my cabin. It's just a, an incredible sight. Everything is full of smoke and oil. I was put in uh, one of the gunnery lockers. It's a big area for treatment and then moved to the wardroom. And I just kept going into the consciousness. And one time I woke up, there was a guy breathing in me. So uh, he said, just stop breathing. Um, his name was Hap Sorensen. You remember who wakes you up? Um, and, uh, and then I just went unconscious, and I woke up on board the HMCS Bonaventure. Well, I personally stayed on the ship. There's no place else for a junior officer to go. It was just, uh, that's just the way it was. You had work to do. You had to look after your people. The, the ship wasn't functioning very well. There were a lot of unhappy people, distressed people, and you still had to try to, you know, function the best you could. The ship was toxic. I mean, you know, you're, you're living in a smoke-filled, burnt ship. It's not pleasant. Everything's black. In a way, the aftermath was as bad as the actual incident itself. And back then, no one ever heard of post-traumatic stress syndrome. So I'm still making round, coming across, you know, a young sailor, and he's like banging and rolling his head against the wall, you know, to get the doctor, you know, another guy is, you know, just, uh, you know, he's lost a lot of his friends, you know. And another sailor came running from somewhere screaming, he was going to jump off the quarter deck, and a couple of guys had to tackle him, hold him down. He was, my reaction took over 30 years, you know. I had a one hell of a delayed reaction. At the time, I did not, I was really was in good shape. But boy, it's bothering me now psychologically, you know, which I can't explain. The, you get the, um, the smell especially. It hasn't left your nostrils. It hasn't left your psychology at all. You could smell it all the time. When you close your eyes to sleep, you have nightmares. You can get all the psychological help you want and all of that, but you don't forget what happens to you and your friends. We have been listening to Explosion at Sea, a documentary prepared by the CBC's Sandra Bartlett and Suzanne Reber. And Sandra is with me in the studio. 
even after all these years, the horror and the sadness is still so evident, Sandra. Nine men dead, more than 50 injured. That's right. And listening to them, you have to wonder why more didn't die. Mm. Now, those who did die, were their bodies brought back to Halifax? Actually, no. It, it was another time. It was Canadian government policy dating back to the World Wars that bodies were buried in the country where the death occurred. And for the Kootenai families, their only choice was earth or sea. So four families chose a cemetery burial and four others chose burial at sea. Hmm. Now, the ninth sailor is buried in Canada because he died of his injuries on board the HMCS Bonaventure as it was returning to Halifax. So this was 1969 and we're talking peacetime, but I'm still trying to get my head around the idea of burial at sea because I didn't think that that happened even 40 years ago. What, what did the families have to say about that policy? Well, as you can imagine, the families were upset, not only about the burial at sea, but a burial in a foreign country. And they were limited as well to how many family members were flown to Plymouth for the funerals. But I guess their message got through because a month later, the policy was quietly changed. And since then, all members of the Canadian forces who die are brought back to Canada for burial. So these families managed to change a policy which is still helping the military families today. We see it when our soldiers die in Afghanistan, huh? And there were other positive changes. For example, on the Kootenai, the ladders were made of aluminum because it's a light metal and the less weight on the ship, the better. While the ladders melted under the intense heat of the fire. So now the ladders are made of steel. Interesting. So the very ladders that would take them to safety were part of the problem. What else was done? Well, actually quite a bit. Firefighting equipment is now located throughout the ship, not just below deck as it was on the Kootenai. And some people think the inability to get to that firefighting equipment might have doomed the ship. The fire might have destroyed it had other nearby ships not come to the rescue with their equipment. So now each section of the ship is outfitted with a full range of firefighting equipment and breathing apparatus. Hmm. And something else came out of this tragedy. Ships were redesigned so that today every area has at least two exits to prevent sailors from being trapped as they were on the Kootenai. So those changes must be of some comfort to those Kootenai sailors who were talking to you. Yes, they are, very much so. And they're also pleased that every sailor in the Canadian Navy learns about the Kootenai explosion as part of firefighting training.